Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. So at the risk of not doing justice to that beautiful gospel, I think today we'll take a very, very close, very close look at the epistle. Uh, St. Paul's epistle to the Corinthians. He's talking about us being the fellow workers, you know, of Christ. Now listen to the end, though. This is what we want to focus on. If anyone... No. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone corrupts the temple of God, God will corrupt him. For the temple of God is holy, whose temple you are. Shall we talk about that? For the temple of God is holy, whose temple you are. So, look at this temple here. This is our, our attempt, you know, our earthly struggle to replicate in some material, wood and paint and the rest, the kingdom of heaven. And it's true, when people come into the church, probably when they come in for the first time, especially, it strikes them as other, other than the normal fallen situation, right? It's different, it's sometimes strange, sometimes they're drawn, you know, like, where, where was I all my life and I didn't know this? Other times they can't take the intensity. Why? The word is holiness. And I think it's a word that we don't talk about as much as we should. Because it's one of the marks of the church. You know, we say in the creed, we are the one holy, holy, holy Catholic and apostolic church. So you have, you know, the right teaching and the right worship and the right way of life. The right way of life. That has to do with holiness. And that's the focus of St. Paul's teaching here, holiness. It's not about being a good person. It's not about being just a nice or good person. We have a million people in the world who are nice, good people. But one, one thing they lack, maybe us too, holiness. If you would be a saint, you have to be holy. If you want to make some meaning out of this life is about, by the end, by the end, by your last day, if you want to be one of these holy ones, you have to do something about it. And that's what St. Paul's talking about here today. Since this temple is so holy, look how we treat it. We treat it with great reverence. We treat it with great dignity. We come in, we venerate the icons like as if we're coming to venerate our own family because we are coming to venerate our own family. We make bows, we make prostrations. What? You're in the presence of God, the holy place, the holy temple. But also, you are the holy temple of God as well. So when the holy temple of God comes into the holy temple of God, right? And like meets like, this is what attracts us to the church. Because the image of God in us brings us like closer and closer to holiness. We love the holiness of God. So, how are we going to get there? How are we going to achieve that in our person, in our bodies even, in our bodies? You know, we're celebrating still this week, right? The Dormition of the Mother of God. Look at her body. Look at her body. Well, first of all, let's look at her life. Holy. Pure. Nobody ever says Mary was a good person. It's kind of trite. It doesn't make any sense. Mary was a good person. No. The Theotokos, the mother of God, was the holiest of holy people. In her womb, she was worthy to, in her womb, carry Christ. Look at that icon way in the back there. That, that little space, you know, that little womb held the God of the universe who could not be contained anywhere, but he was contained there. He allowed himself to go there. Why? Because of her holiness. Because of her humility, her purity, her, you know, all the rest of it. And here's the thing. 
in her person, she kept soul and body holy. Soul and body. We, we talk a lot about the, the soul. We talk a lot about the spirit and all the spiritual life and how to live the spiritual life. But what about this body, right? Do we throw it away? Is it so much garbage that we just toss the body? The body is sacred. It's sacred. Especially if it's informed by the soul. If the soul, with all the grace of God, permeates, permeates, permeates into the body, you know? This is how you have the mother of God. When she falls asleep, we don't even say when she dies, when she leaves this life, the Lord, her own son, is there because of the holiness of her life to take her infant soul. If you look at the icon, you see her body laid out on the, on the beard, but you see her taking the little, him taking the little soul, baby soul, of his mother into the kingdom of God. Right away. And she doesn't see any demons. She doesn't get any temptations. He won't allow anything to happen to her soul. He takes her right. And then, at some point between then and a couple days later, when Thomas comes and doesn't find the body of the Lord, of the mother, of the mother of God there, sometime between then and then, she was taken in her body to the kingdom. Body. You go to Jerusalem, we were just there a couple months back. You go into her tomb, where is the body of the mother? We are trying to find out. You go in, through there, empty tomb. Empty tomb. Just like not far away from there, her son's tomb also. Empty tomb. She's the only human being, the only one, the only non like. Christ is God and man, the only non-divine by nature human being who right now, even before the end of time, even before the second coming, is in the kingdom of God, body and soul. Body and soul. Why? How? Her, the grace of her holy life, which was pouring out of her spirit, you know, poured into that body itself, kept it uncorrupted, kept it holy, you see? And so, impossible for that body. And I mean, it's just a body, right? It's like us, flesh and bone. But the Lord would not allow his mother to see corruption, to taste any corruption. He took her, even her body. And now she's sitting at the right hand of her son in glory, body and soul, even before the end. Meditate on that. When you hear St. Paul's words, when he says, you are holy. Do not defile the temple of God. Look at the Theotokos. Never defile. Allow herself to be defiled. Woe to those, you know, others who teach that she had other children. God forbid. Woe to those, you know, who said that, like, she had relations. Ever. Ever. Never. She's, you see the, let's see if we have it. The three stars, the one on her head. And the two on her shoulders, those three stars, you know what they represent? She was a virgin, pure and holy, before she gave birth. She was a virgin, pure and holy, during the birth giving. There's a whole bunch of theological commentary on that, how this miraculous birth happened. And then, the third star, the one we're talking about now, how she remained a virgin even after giving birth and to the end of her days. Always pure. Always. And in fact, the church uses, catechumens know this, the, the uh, technique of typology. Typology, right? So, in the Old Testament it says, the doorway was shut. The doorway was shut. The doorway was shut. You know, the doorway of the temple. Shut. The gate was shut. The gate was shut. The gate remained shut. Even to the end of her days. Pure and holy virgin, always, to this minute, and to the ages of ages, okay? And even, by the way, the saints, if you look at the saints, and many of us have been blessed to venerate the relics of saints, what is, what are we kissing? When we're venerating, like, a piece of the body of one of the saints, what are we kissing? Are we just kissing some corrupted thing, like some body that went into the ground and then... Dug it up and we kiss it? 
No. These relics, oftentimes, when God allows certain saints to remain uncorrupted, you know, they're exuding this beautiful fragrance. They're exuding this beautiful myrrh, this like oil-like oil -like substance, you know, that has a beautiful fragrance. And sometimes when you touch it to a person's body, they heal of whatever sickness they have. And this happens many times. And there are many, many, many saints where that is happening. How? How could that be possible? The grace of God that overflowed their spirit into their body. So that even after their death, the Lord did not allow that body to decompose, to corrupt. To be sure, there's definitely saints, you know, who are in the kingdom of heaven that we don't know that they're incorrupted or whatever. But look what he does. God allows many of the saints to remain uncorrupted for a sign, for a witness to you. To you. That we could have holiness like that. That if you live a certain kind of life and avoid certain kinds of things in your body or and or repent of those certain kind of things, you can you too can have a holy body at the end of time. Even if it's not being corrupted in this life, what we're looking for is when our body and our soul reunite at the end of time, will we have a spotless combination? Will we be able to see, to look upon our baptismal garment and it's as white as when we were baptized? Or, even, even better, it's as pure and as holy as the mother of the gods. That's something to shoot for. This is something to live for. And I don't hear it outside of the Orthodox Church. You don't hear it, do you? We need to live holy lives. We need to do holy things. No. We're hearing the opposite. Do whatever you want. You know, like, this is what we need to be raising our children in. Listen to this quote from St. Tikhon. St. Tikhon of Zadans says, you know, when you stand before the, the dread judgment seat, he said, God is not going to ask you whether you taught your children how to speak French or German or Italian, as nice as those things are. He's going to ask you, did you teach your children how to live according to the gospel? How to be pure? How to live a holy life? Have we taught our children and have we taught ourselves how to maintain a holy life? And the big part of it, especially I'm talking in the year 2019 now, so the huge part of this, the beginning part, but it's still a huge part, not to defile our bodies. <coughs> not to defile our bodies. At the end of time, the body will carry the marks of what was done to it or what was done with it, right? At the end of time, everyone will see of anything unrepented that we did in or with our bodies. Teaching of the church. The judgment is nothing more than that. It's nothing more than presenting yourself. You see why it's so important? First of all, not to defile our temples, your temple, your holy place. And then secondly, if you do, if you have, to repent of it with tears and with a lot of love, you know, that God gave you another chance to remove those scars from your person, from your body. Anything not reflecting the holiness of the image and likeness of God, whose image you are, will stand out and it will be quite out of place, you know, and maybe to the left side. I don't know you. Because if Christ doesn't know something in you, how can he know you? That's a strange thing there. So let's, let me be a little bit more specific. Why do we fast? Why do we fast, first of all? Because, you know, like, we eat too much. First of all, we love food, we love, and, you know, like, this, eat, eat, eat it defiles our bodies. St. John Chrysostom really rails about that. He says, look at these people walking around with distended, he calls them distended stomachs, you know, like, this is, is this the kind of body I want to have in the resurrection? But we fall, we eat too much, or we eat the delicious foods, or whatever. So fasting, even a simple practice of 
fasting in some way to offer something to destroy that that idolatry that I have for my own stomach. Even. So there's a simple, very simple. I'm not going to defile myself with getting drunk. I'm not going to defile myself with getting overdosed or drugs. I'm not going to define myself with this, or this, or this, or this, but really, I have to say, it. the big one is what we do with our body in the realm of all realm of sexuality. Oh my gosh. We as a nation, as a, as a world, are in bitter trouble these days because of this. And we call them, we call all of this craziness, we call it, we call it, Social, what is it? Social issues. Social issues. You know what a social issue is? It's whether or not you and I, like, like at, we're sitting at a table and, you know, like, should I eat with the right hand or the left hand? That's a social issue. These are not social issues, my dears. This is life and death. This is whether I'm living the life of holiness or not. If I'm living any kind of lifestyle, <coughs> You know, that's outside of the norm. You know, when you get, how many times right here, we had a man and a woman get married, right? In the church. How can we do that? Because they're being married, covered with the veil of holiness. This is the Lord himself, you know, putting his seal, his blessing on that marriage. That's why we do that here. In the bosom of the church, that's why it's a holy mystery. And St. Paul talks about that. Why it's a holy mystery? You know, because it's reflective of who Jesus Christ is. This, man and woman. And you know, I don't want to get off track, but... So, I, like, I've only, I've only been without my wife for like two weeks now, right? <laughs> and I was telling Father Larry this morning, I said, I, she's got to come home because the other day I thought I was putting Stevie in my coffee. I was putting the dog's CBD oil in my coffee. <laughs> It's not, it's not good. It's not good. What did Christ say? What did God say in Genesis? Not good for man to be alone. Not good. Not good. I promise you. Not good. You know, on a number of levels. Right? But that's what's blessed in the church. That has the potential for holiness. And we can talk all about marriage. How two souls, when they become really one, the flame of that marriage brighter than any single soul, even the most ascetic saint, if that marriage is like that. Hmm. Holiness. That's how a man and a wife do it, right? Any other kind of situation, not right, not holy, going to be noticed at the judgment seat, and that includes, you know, I have all these kids here. Right? We should have a retreat on this, actually. Premarital and extramarital and same and all the rest of it, trans and, and, and all of this. Where does all of this teaching come from? It comes from the dropping of holiness from our vocabulary. Who cares about being holy? Let's just let's just have pleasure. Let's just seek pleasure. You know, we were I was talking to somebody the other day, one of you, I guess. We're talking about how in the old Roman Empire, right, when the first couple of centuries uh, after Christ, how the Christians, this was the issue. This was the issue. I mean, there were theological issues, but this was the issue. The issue of holiness in your body or not. And the Romans, the pagans, they were very upset with the Christians. Why? Because, I mean, the Christians weren't railing at them about this, but they were living holy lives. And when somebody sees somebody living a holy life, and they're not, and they don't want to be, you know what they do? They go crazy, and they all attack, and they'll even kill. And there's a lot of parallels on this issue, and on some others too, but on this one, between where we are now, in the culture, in the situation of Christians living the pure life, as back in the early Roman times, first, second, third century, right? The same. 
The time is coming. It might not be here totally yet. But the time is coming where you, living this monogamous, holy life, or the celibate life, especially in the monastery, we can talk about that too. This is awesome. If you're living either one of those kinds of lives, you will be persecuted. You will be attacked. At first, you'll be ridiculed, discarded, marginalized. Then you'll be attacked. I guarantee it. Why? Because they not only, they mean anybody who doesn't agree with the teachings of Christ about holiness and the gospel, they don't want to be indicted. They don't want to be called out. Not by our words even. Although, that's going to have to happen too, like right now. But by our life. Just by our life. They're going to look at our life and they're going to say, not good enough. They're going to want us to sign something, you know, or do something like that. We agree that it's okay for this, 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 this. Not okay. So here's the difference, you know, like, like in the old Roman Empire, when the government and the church are at odds. What's your choice? What's your choice? I'm an, I'm an American, first and foremost. Well, we have that problem. Or, I'm a Greek, or I'm a Serbian, or I'm, you know, we have that problem. Well, that's more important than the holiness of God, you know? At the top of our career of being here, I need to reflect the image of God everything that I do and am. So that when you look at me at the end of time, you can see spotlessness. Are we falling short of that? That's the beginning. That's only the first step, right? To not fall short of that. But then we have to reflect it. You know, there's, we always talk about this, um, what are the three that the church teaches? Purification, illumination, sanctification. Holiness, the top one is to be like to be like God, to be exactly like God. Illumination. And then the first though. How can you be like God if you're not pure in your body? If you're not pure in your temple, in your holy place. We would never do things in this church, right? That violate the holiness of the church. Like we're not gonna like have a dance in here or a big a game of some kind. Which is not even be like possible. We say, well, wow, who could even think of that? And yet, with our temple, we're doing some things. We do some things or we, you know, permit some things or allow some things or say it's okay to do some things or whatever that violate this temple. Each of you has the same, what's the word, stewardship that we have for the holy place, you know, this holy place, for your holy place. Because here's who God is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You see those three pure beings, pure persons who are totally in holy love with each other. Nothing short of that. Anything that's self-seeking, that tears at the unity of that, which we're supposed to reflect that. We're supposed to be in community like God is in community. So anything that tears away from that, like for selfish reasons, pleasure, <coughs> comfort, I don't know, you name it, right? Worry, I mean, anything that tears away from that makes us less of the person that God wanted us to be, that He's meant for us to be. So find those places in your body. Find those places in your body that are not pure, that are not clean, that are not holy. So that you can do something about it. You know, the beautiful thing is, we have Christ. Christ washes away every sin that you repent of. Every one of them. As long as you repent of it. He can't, unless you give him something, he's not going to, you know, cleanse it. He's not going to cleanse it unless I want it to be cleansed. I've lived this kind of life of debauchery or craziness, like Mary Egypt. But the minute she turns to repentance, it took her a little nudge, a divine nudge. Don't wait for that moment. You might not get one. From that 
moment on, she lived a completely different life of asceticism, of holiness, of simplicity. Look, we have with us Sister Pion, a monastic, right? It's a blessing to go to the monastery, and it's a blessing to have a monastic sometimes come visit us. Why? Because you know what they do there? For those of us who are married or trying to live even in the world single, which is so hard. But you know what they do there? They treat this temple, on the one hand, like the most holy, revered thing in the world. On the other hand, they treat it like a block of wood. Dead. Dead to all pleasures. Dead to all self-seeking. Dead to all, right? If that's the teaching in the monastery, it'd be nice by the end of our life, when we're on our deathbeds at least, to have that. To have a little piece of that. You know? To have the love of holiness. Because that's what we're going to have to have when we step over into the next life. You know, when they go to the monastery, they step over into the next life already. They die to all of this stuff. So we must, to some degree, at least notice that, at least acknowledge that, at least look at that. And then we'll be able to say, without judging, you know, you know what judgment is? Judgment is when I say, you are a sinner and you're bound for hell. That's judgment. But if I say, how I'm living, or how you are living, or how we are living, is evil. Because evil, think about it, what's the definition of sin? It's like, we can do better. We're missing the, the mark here. What we're practicing is going to die with the grave. Or, worse, we're going to take that passion with us into the next life and not be able to fulfill it or satisfy it. <coughs> That's hell. That's the deepest part of hell right there. So, anything that's blessed and holy, practice. Practice. Enjoy. Have joy in Christ. Anything that's not blessed and not holy, how did my old spiritual father used to say it? Abandon. <laughs> it's either compatible or it's not with the Christian life. You're receiving the body and blood of Christ, which is the pure and holy, right? And you're practicing something else. Abandon. Abandon. Otherwise, you're, you're dead already. You're living two lives. And the one you're really living is the one that's incompatible with the kingdom of God. So you know what I'm talking about here. We have a lot of problems in this whole area. We have to begin with our own selves. Do I love the purity and the holiness of Christ? Or do I love my own pleasure? Do I love my own self on some level? It's a good teaching, St. Paul said. He said, the Lord wants us to recognize the holiness of our own temples. If that will change your life significantly, well, then you better do something going to change it significantly. If it's going to tweak it a bit and make you more aware and more alert and more vigilant for the sake of the kingdom of God, that's good. That's all of us. We could all do a little bit better on that. No. Right? So let this, let this teaching burn in there, but inspire us because what we're doing is reflecting in our own temples our love for God. Here, it's very simple. If I'm living that kind of holy life, this is my posture towards the Lord. Holiness. Holiness, He can look on me. If I have even an ounce of holiness, right? He can look on me. But when I start violating my temple, here's what happens. This is the posture. Maybe even back, we both turn our backs to each other. That's my choice. I've chosen to be with Christ in holiness or to turn my back and just Turn on that on holiness and not, not reflect it at all. But just remember, like when you look at the moon, we always see the light side of the moon, there's a dark side, too, which we don't see. So please don't show that side to the Lord. You know, everything's darkness. When I'm looking away from Christ, everything over here is dark. But the world is telling us, celebrate that. Dance around it. Do anything you want.
continent. Be with anybody you want. A hundred people, a thousand people. No problem. Why? Because your back's to Christ. There's no question of holiness. There's only you. You are God. You are the God now that He's created. Is that square with what you heard in the epistle today? Does that even square with the gospel? You know, when Peter's looking at Christ, focusing on Him, this man is walking on water. When he looks at his own <coughs> self, this man is sinking in water. Don't sink. Don't sink. Don't, don't take your eyes for a minute off Christ. Because that's the only chance we have to be holy people. You're going to hear in just a minute. Just before the Holy Communion. Holy gifts or holy things for the holy. Is that us? Is that us? Amen. Let us sing our own song. 